Hey guys, so welcome to another Q&A for the Tech Editor Hub. Today's topics, uh, mainly two, all the questions kind of fell into two uh, categories. So the first one that we're going to talk about is newsletters, um, writing newsletters as a tech editor, kind of what to send, what to put in it, and systems for making writing the newsletter easier, and then keeping track of time, like what when do I start the timer? When do I shut it off? What do I use um, to keep track of the time? So those are the two topics today. So let's dive in with newsletters. The reason why I advocate that tech editors have a newsletter is because that is the one thing that you kind of control, the one thing that you kind of own. So if you're using Instagram, if you're using Facebook groups, that's all great. And Definitely, those are places where people are getting clients, but the those places could change, right? The Facebook group that you're in could close down. They could that person running it could just decide they don't want that Facebook any Facebook group anymore. Um, Instagram algorithms are constantly changing, and it's hard to make sure uh, people are seeing your posts. Everyone who like wants to see your posts is seeing it, and so. My recommendation is always to use social media as a way to drive people to your newsletter list and to use your newsletter list as a way to build the relationship with your clients. I think for tech editors, a monthly newsletter makes sense. I would send it at the beginning of the month. Um, and I would always start out by saying, by starting out with a little text paragraph that says like, hey, here's what I've been up to. Um, maybe you feature some designs that you tech edited that were published recently so like you can see like you could say like here's some highlights from my clients or um kind of just a little bit of fluff here but it would also make a really strong call to action at the beginning of your newsletter saying like you know uh it's time for a new month i have this number of spots available or i'm taking on five new clients this month or you know I have you know even if you don't want to give a number you could say say something like I still have a little bit of space in my editing calendar for this month if you want to hire me if you know you're going to release a pattern this month hit reply to this email to get in touch so I would make it really clear like that you are planning out your month as far as editing work goes and if people want to get in then they need to kind of get in touch with you um, so a really strong, clear, strong and clear call to action right at the beginning of the newsletter. Then the rest of your newsletter is about providing value to your potential clients. So you want to give people a reason to open your newsletter. Things like maybe you do a book review and this could be like a written book review of, or a video. Right, you could either embed a video or link to like a YouTube video that you've done. Um, think about if there's any like books, like knitting books that you've read or crochet books that you've read that would be helpful, you think, for your clients. Um, tossing in a little review. You have to think like it might seem daunting, but if you send one a month, then you only need 12 books, right? You only need 12 book reviews, and you could do a book review in every single um, newsletter, something like that, something helpful. I know sometimes. Some people are including calls for submissions that they found. So they'll spend like the previous month collecting calls for submissions and keeping track of the deadlines. And then they'll send out those to um, to their newsletter list. Um, I think like a link roundup is another section that would be really useful. So just linking to other people's stuff, other people's podcasts that you enjoyed, like a particular episode. Um, what I would do is I would think about who are other people that aren't tech editors that are sharing really helpful content for designers? And so you can think about people like Tara Swiger or um, Frenchie of Araho Knits or Chelsea, who's Knit Fitch. Um, those are kind of people like focused on our industry who are sharing always helpful podcast episodes or blog posts or things going on in their Facebook groups. You can share stuff like that. But also think about outside of our industry. Are there people you follow um, that might also provide helpful content, just not specifically for designers? So people like me and Orla, who talks about um, Instagram a lot. People like Gary V or Marie Forleo or Think Creative or Mariah Cause. Um, 
you know, any of those people, those are people like I follow, but think, think about people outside of like our small little world who are putting out really great, helpful content about marketing, about mindset, about, um, anything really copywriting, like just things that you found helpful. Do you think maybe someone building a business, um, in a creative industry would also find helpful? Um, then that's kind of like, like all you need in a newsletter, right? Like you have a little bit of text, you have some piece of content that you created, establishing your expertise, building your reputation. Then you have links to other people's content, showing that you're, um, showing that you're helpful and thoughtful and really thinking about your clients. And then you can end with a little bit of text. You could end with like, sometimes I would link to my top Instagram post that month. Um, like from the previous month, because people are missing things on Instagram all the time. Um, maybe you write a little bit about what's coming up for you. Are you going to any events? Are you traveling? Um, what's going on? And then just, you know, end with like, don't forget to hit reply to this email. If you uh, need a tech editor this month, sign your name. That's kind of the basics of a newsletter. Now, this is going to probably feel really overwhelming if you just like sit down today and try and bust out this whole thing. What I recommend doing is using something like Asana or Trello or pen and paper or bookmarking, like something, some system of keeping track of links that you've liked or have found helpful or content that you've made that you want to share, keeping track of that all throughout the month. So I would personally use Trello. Um, that's one thing, another topic that I want to do in a future Q and A session, um, is kind of looking at how I use Trello. It's free. It's, uh, someone described it as like virtual post-it notes, which I kind of love. Um, but it's really, really awesome. And you could just create, you basically have like lists, but the lists are made up of cards, not just like text. They're like, like post-it notes. And so you could just make a list that says like monthly newsletter ideas and you can just every time you find something or write something, create something, read something, just copy the link and put it in there. Whether you, it doesn't mean it's definitely going in your newsletter list, right? And you could even brainstorm topics, right? Anytime you get an idea for something, you want to talk about style sheets, you want to talk about um, charts, you want to talk about Stitch Mastery, you found a helpful Stitch Mastery tutorial, like anything, just keep a, a running list of that in your in this card in this um you know board and then when you go to sit down to write your newsletter you have all of that content to review and you can just like copy and paste put in those links slot in that video here's your text for the month and you're done it should take like an hour um so you kind of need to create a system throughout the whole month of the whole month previous to you sending your newsletter of keeping track of content keeping track of ideas um, make sure that your newsletter list, your newsletter, um, is helpful first and foremost, I think, cause you really, you need to give people a reason to open it. And if they know like, oh, every time I get this email from so-and-so, it's got really helpful things that I like to, you know, look at that means they're going to, your open rates are going to stay high. And then also making sure it always has a really clear call to action that you are taking on clients that people can just hit reply and send you a message and you'll pencil them in. Um, maybe link to like your, if you have like a page on your website that details the process of working with you. So they know like, okay, I don't need to have my photos finished yet. Right. You could do a whole series about like common myths that people have when it comes to working with a tech editor. One is that, um, people think you have to have the everything picture perfect. Like all the photos need to be final. The pattern needs to be perfectly laid out. It needs to just be like ready to go. And that's when you send it to your tech editor which is not true, right? You don't need the final photos. You just need some photos and you don't need it to be in the final layout. Um, or maybe you do, like it depends on, I prefer things in the final layout um, just from the way I work and like the way I visualize things. If the pattern is looks visually messy, it feels messy in my head. So I, that's the way I work, not the way everyone works. So, you know, explaining the process of working with you and all of those things. Um, so that could be like a series you do, um, or just a blog post you write that you link to in your newsletter, things like that. Um, so yeah, making sure that, um, people know that they can hire you, how to hire you, what they need, 
um, and making sure like you either link to that or explain that in your newsletter. Um, your newsletter can be very formulaic if that's what you like. That's what I like. I like to kind of know what I'm doing every month. Um, but you might not want to do that. You might want it to be far more free form, which is fine. Um, whatever makes it easiest for you to get that newsletter out every month. They do think um, you need to be building an email list and um, getting people onto your list from social media. Now, how do you get people onto your list from social media? You need to create a really good reason for them to sign up. You need to let them know what they're getting, like they're getting, um, you know, tips sent to you every month or they're getting whatever. Um, and I also recommend creating what is called an opt-in, which is something that you give people in return for them signing up. So it's usually like a PDF that you send them, like a free guide, or um, sometimes people use discount codes. I don't really recommend using a discount for your tech editing work just because I feel like you're devaluing yourself. Um, but if that's working for you and those clients who come in for the discount are then returning, then that's that's totally fine. Like that's if it's working, it's working, that's great. Um, I just don't really ever offer a discount on my tech editing because like that's my time and my time doesn't get discounted. Um but yeah, so creating like a, a PDF, like a style sheet or a challenge, like a five day pattern writing challenge, I know I think someone did. Um there are a lot of different things that you can offer. Um, and those, that's what you can advertise on social media. You can re-sign up for my list and you'll get this thing. And then once they're on your list, that's when you start talking about like the benefits of working with a tech editor and, you know, how to work with a tech editor and all of those things. And that's kind of my spiel about newsletters. Um, again, if you had questions that I didn't cover, um, feel free to leave them in the comments and I can talk about this again next week. This is something that's covered a bit in the Learn to Tech Edit course um, in I think module eight. It's something that we talk about way more in Marketing for Tech Editors, which is a separate course. And in that course, like I have video tutorials showing you like how to set up an opt-in in ConvertKit and how to set up an opt-in in MailChimp. So you know like the exact technical uh, how to for delivering both of those opt-ins, but it's really quite simple. That's kind of the basics of a newsletter. Like I said, I do think it's important because it's going to be the best way to get your content and your message in front of a devoted audience. People who have given you their email address are already quite invested in you as a tech editor, um, as opposed to someone who's just kind of following you on Instagram. So it also really helps with trying to anticipate goals, right? So a lot of people say to me like, oh, I want to get to the point where I have 10 clients a month. Like that would be really good if I had 10 paying jobs a month. Um, but then you're like, okay, that's, that's a good goal, right? But what are the actions that are going to get you that? What are the actions that are going to get you to 10 clients a month? And they go, I don't know. Well, and I think, okay, well, what's working? And they go, I don't know. And so we have to kind of track things more. Now, if you can tell me, um, one of the ways of tracking is to say, like, let's say you have 50 people on your email list and you get two clients every month. So then you go, OK, well, 50 subscribers gives me two clients. Well, I need 10 clients. So I need 250 subscribers. OK, that's a more concrete goal. So now we're going to try and get you to 250 subscribers. OK, so what can we do? How do, how do we get that? Well, okay, you're going to post on Instagram and you're going to post on Instagram with a post that says like, hey, sign up to my newsletter and you get this thing. And then you're going to wait and you're going to, you know, you're going to write down your number of newsletter subscribers before you did that post. And then you're going to wait like maybe 48 hours um, and see how many newsletter subscribers you have now. Did it go up? Okay. Like how much did it go up? And so then you can kind of get an idea of like how much does that Instagram post affect your newsletter list? Then maybe the next week you post about this in a Facebook group. Um, don't do them both at the same time if we're like trying to track data unless you can track clicks, um, like where the clicks came from, if they came from Facebook or if they came from Instagram. If you have a way of doing that, then fine. But otherwise, I would stagger it so that one week you could post on Instagram, see the effect. The next week you could post on Facebook in a Facebook group and see the effect. And then you kind of get an idea of, okay, What's working like and okay, so Facebook was better than Instagram. Okay, so if I post on Facebook, 
um, twice a month and I'm getting, you know, 20 new subscribers every time I do it. That's 40 a month and I need 200. So that's what, like five, five months, <laughs> um, you would hit your goal. So like, right. So that, and it's not definite, it's not guaranteed, but it kind of gives you something to aim for and lets you, gives you a baseline for then you can say, okay, well, like, Maybe if I tweak my opt-in or if I tweak the wording, um, instead of posting and getting like 20 new subscribers, I'll post and I'll get 40 new subscribers. Well, then I've doubled it. So I half the time to my goal, right? Does that make sense? So kind of having that like a, a path, you post on social media, you track your email subscribers, you send an email, you track the number of new clients, like having that really clear path um, helps you just make decisions and evaluate and figure out what's successful and what's not successful. Whereas if your path is kind of just posting on Instagram, now sometimes you will post on Instagram and just immediately get a new client. Um, but that's kind of harder to track because a lot of times you post on Instagram and you get no new clients. So then how are you going to track like how many times you have to post to get the number of new clients that you need? Does that make sense? So if you're into like crunching the data, um, having that, social media to email list to clients um, path works really, really well. Okay, so Brown's question is, a lot of us tech editors are also designers. I have a newsletter list for designing, but most of those readers are not interested in tech editing. What would be a smart way to differentiate and start a second list? So you're gonna have two links, and when you post something that's related to your design, uh, let's say you're on Instagram, you're going to make a really clear call to action that says, use the link in my profile to sign up for my designing newsletter or something, or to sign up to hear about new designs, basically, is the wording. And so people know when they sign up for that, they're going to get to your designing list. When you make a clear call to action about tech editing, you're gonna say sign up to hear more about tech editing or whatever, to get tips for designers, whatever it is that you offer, you're gonna say sign up to hear about that. So to differentiate, it's you're really just differentiating like where the sign up pages are and the opt-ins that you're offering. So your sign up list, your sign up form for your tech editing would be like on your tech editing services page. Your sign up list for your designers um, thing would be on like a page about you as a designer. You could also put in the footer of the emails, um, like usually they have something that says like you're getting this email because you signed up to hear about designing if you signed up if you'd also like to hear about tech editing or you can sign up here and then in your other email you would do the opposite right you are getting this email because you signed up to hear about tech editing from me if you'd also like to hear about designing um click here and so then that kind of lets people know about the two different lists so you're really just going to be really clear about what people are getting when they're signing up. So sign up to hear about my designing, sign up to hear about my tech editing. And then if people end up on both lists, that's fine. That's totally fine. And then um, you kind of, if you have information in the footer, you're letting people kind of move from one list to another. Um, but don't stress about it. When I had two separate lists for designers and tech editing, well, I had tech editing students, not um, clients, because I was never smart enough to create an email list for my tech editing clients. Like, it was not a done thing. Um, but I did have tech editing students, like people interested in learning about tech editing to become a tech editor. And I had people who wanted to hear about my designs. It was very easy to keep them separate. Um, it was just the way that people got onto the list, um, made it very clear which list they were signing up for and then um i did have like a, a header um for my designing list and my tech editing email was actually just more of like text based rather than having images in um but yeah i think i think it's fine i wouldn't stress about it generally people are going to be pretty aware um that they're signing up for like a different a different list or they're going to be clear about what they're getting when they sign up um so yeah that's how you do it you just have two separate lists two separate forms for people to sign up with um and then yeah simple the other topic that got brought up um in the q a thread was about keeping track of time and timing an editing job so when do i start the timer 
when do I shut off the timer, um, those kinds of things, and what tools do I use to keep track of the time. So when do I start my tech editing timer? I start my tech edit like when I'm, as soon as like I'm ready, like I'm got the pattern printed out and it's in front of me. I've got it opened up on my iPad. Like I've sat down, I've got my pen, I've got my calculator. I'm ready to go. Timer goes on. I work through it. Um, I, yeah, I do my edit. Um, and then when I get to the end, the timer stops. Except this kind of ties into what timer do I use? So I use a Pomodoro timer. So there are multiple apps for timing Pomodoros. But basically, a Pomodoro is a unit of time. It's a 25 minute, sometimes it's 20, I like 25, 25 minute work session and a five minute break. Um, and so what I do is I sit down to work, um, the Pomodoro timer starts, I um, I do my work for 25 minutes focused, then I get a five minute break. I go, I get a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom, stretch my legs, check my email, pick, go up on Twitter, whatever. Um, timer goes off again, letting me know that the five minute break is over and I start another Pomodoro. Once, when I've completed one Pomodoro, so some apps will let you like make categories. So you can make like an editing category. You start the timer, um, and you say like, this is editing. And then at the end of the day, it will say like, oh, you did three editing Pomodoros, whatever. Mine doesn't do that. So what I will do is once one is completed, I will just mark it off, like just one tick. So that's how I do it. I like to have breaks. Um, now this will not work for everyone. If you're a person who gets like super in the flow of things and you just like work for an hour straight, then that's awesome. Then just work for an hour straight. I find I do better. Um, if I, uh, stand up every 25 minutes, like I just, as long as I like finish the section that I'm on, um, I'm like, I feel like I'm at a good stopping point and sometimes I go a little bit over. So it works for me. Um, like it's a system that I've honed that I'm really comfortable with. Some on my Pomodoro timer, which I know someone's going to ask, I use one called Tide, T-I-D-E. I like it because it's also my meditation timer. You can choose to play like soothing background noises or not. Um, you can adjust the time. You can adjust the time for both the, um, the, the work section and the break section. So you can make it, some people do 45 minutes of work um, or 40, 40 minutes of work and a five minute break, 45 minutes of work and a 10 minute break. Like you kind of need to figure out like what's good for you. Um, but I wouldn't work for too long without taking a break, honestly. Like, this is why we get distracted. Like, I'm going to film a video um, when I finish this about wasting time and feeling good enough. Like, one of the reasons we get so distracted is because we work ourselves so hard and we don't take a break that then, like, we revolt subconsciously and we, um, you know, end up spending, like, two hours on Facebook. Whereas if you take a make a conscious choice to take a five minute break, the timer is going for five minutes, then you feel like, okay, I got a break. I'm ready to go back to work now. Like stand up, get water, stretch, take care of yourself, practice those acts of self-care um, instead of just working for like 90 minutes straight without, you know, moving, especially if you're sitting down at a computer. Okay. So Sarah says, do I stop the timer if I have to look stuff up? Um, yes, I would. I would wait until I got to a break. So I would, if I, if I could, um, if there were like, you know, 25 minutes, I like it because it's a short period of time, right? Like if you just start it and you're like, oh, I have to look something up, then you can just cancel that Pomodoro. But like most of the time, if you needed to do like look something up, you're probably like 20 minutes in. So it's a good, it's a good time because you can do stuff in 25 minutes, but it's not like if you, if you do have to take a break, um, you're not like waiting ages for it to finish. So you can go take your break. Right. Um, so I would finish up my work timer and I would like stand up and stretch, go get my cup of water. And before I start the Pomodoro timer again, I would go look up the thing I need to go look up. Um, 
assuming it's going to take me a long time. Like I assuming like I don't have the piece of information. If it's five minutes, if it's something like I've got to Google, oh, I don't know this abbreviation. Let me Google it. Then I'm timing for that. That's part of the job. Um, but if it's like, oh, I don't remember how a dolman sleeve should be constructed. I've got to go consult my book. Um, then I would like pause. I would go and consult my book. I'd find the page. Now, if you then have to like bring it back and then you're working with the pattern again and you're checking it against your book, that's timing, right? That, that's the editing part. But if you're just like, oh, I need to go find the book, look up the section, make sure this is the information that I need, that I would not time for. Um, just because cause I feel like that's like, that's my, oh, I didn't have that knowledge in my head. When I set my hourly rate, remember, I build into my hourly rate accounting for things like I don't time for writing emails. I don't time for the, or charge for the final edit. I don't charge for going to look things up in a book, right? I don't charge for any of that stuff, but my hourly rate is inflated to what I actually want to make. If theoretically I wanted to make 20 pounds an hour, I would then theoretically charge 30 pounds or 35 pounds an hour to account for all of the things that I'm not billing, to account for all of the admin time, to account for taxes getting taken out of my salary eventually, right? So I have a massive buffer in my hourly rate. Um, so I don't time things like if I have to go look something up because that's like my personal growth. So yeah, so for me, timing is I'm sitting down with the pattern. I have the pattern. I really like to print out patterns still, um, but or on my iPad. If it's a short pattern, it's on my iPad. Sitting down with the pattern, I've got my calculator, I've got my spreadsheet open, I'm doing all the editing, take my break, go look something up, come back, sit back down. I'm ready to work. I'm timing again. That's how I do it. I think that covers everything. Like, if it's the pattern's fault, if the pattern is bad, right? If it's the pattern's fault that you can't understand something and that takes you a while, um, then that we're timing for, right? But if it's like, oh, I don't remember this thing, then that's on me. That's not on the designer. I hope that helps. So coming up, uh, future Q and A's, I want to do, um, a video about Trello and using that for, as a tech editor to like, plan social media, plan newsletters, plan keep track of clients, um, where clients are in the different stages. Um, so I want to do a Q&A about Trello and I want to do a Q&A about um, the four tendencies and how that applies to us as tech editors. So I'll post a link to the quiz. So the four tendencies is a framework set up by Gretchen Rubin and it kind of uh, lays out how you respond to expectations, which basically means like, how do you get stuff done? Like, are you good when people tell you what to do? Are you good at like deciding for yourself what you're gonna do? Like you say today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for a run and I'm gonna do three editing jobs and I'm gonna post on Instagram and you get all of that done. Um, like, how do you respond to expectations that are placed on you both by other people and by yourself? And then looking at like, well, how does that affect us as tech editors? Specifically, like if you're an obliger who responds to um, external expectations, so might be really good with like a deadline set by a client, but doesn't do so well with internal expectations, which is like, I need to send my newsletter out or I need to post on social media, like that's an internal expectation. And, and a rebel who doesn't like any expectations, doesn't want, deadlines put on them by other people. They don't want to put deadlines on themselves. Um, so like, how are those two tendencies really working? Um, because I think if you're an upholder, which is you respond well to all expectations, you don't have a problem. Like you just, you get your work, you do your work, you have your social media plan, you're fine. Um, and a questioner just does what they think is important, but they have no problem with like their internal expectations. So like if they want to go running, like they're fine with that. They'll go running. If they think it's important and helpful, they'll just do it. So as a tech editor, like you understand your, your client deadlines. You're like, okay, I'm good with that. Um, and you just do them because they make sense to you and you're good with your own stuff. But these two, the two categories of being an obliger, which you don't do well with your own expectations and being a rebel, you don't do well with any expectations. I think it's an interesting topic to look at kind of how, how do we get things done? Um, so those are two topics for future Q and A's. I will obviously keep posting the 
thread on Mondays for you guys to add your questions. Thank you guys so much for being here, for joining, for asking questions. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, come over to the Facebook group with a tech editor hub on Facebook. Links are in the description below. We would love to have you. And I will talk to you guys soon.